Okay. This is where we want to be now. Okay. So I want to introduce to you um, the membership committee. Um, all of us on the committee were body piercers. Um, so that's what we do for a living, right? Uh, we're also APP members. Um, at one point or another, we all weren't members of the association. We had to apply and become members, and then uh, we started to get involved and volunteer on committees. Um, and so we're also all volunteers. We don't do this for money. This is not a job. Uh, this is a contribution uh, to the organization that we care about. Um, so we volunteer our free time on the committee to review applications and help piercers around the world. Um, so we have myself, Monica Sabin. I serve as the membership liaison for the organization. We have Pablo Perlmuter. Uh, he serves as the membership coordinator currently. William Barron, Cody Vaughn, Johnny Velez, Sabrina Egan, Cosmo Whitest, and Christina Outland. Everybody here is either on screen or in the chat to help you out. Somebody who isn't here today, but I think is worth mentioning is uh, Marina Pecorino. So sometimes before you fill out your application and after the committee makes a decision, you may interact with Marina. Uh, they are our membership administrator and one of the employees for the association, um, but uh, they are a part of kind of the membership team. Pablo, can you um, go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm having trouble doing uh, it from my side. You're still right now. Got you. Oops. Okay, thank you. Sorry, we're just testing out this new way of presenting the slide. Thanks for being patient with us. Um, something that I wanted to announce also before we start talking about the membership criteria is uh, something really cool, really important. Um, the APP recently made uh, the digital download of our procedure manual free, free of cost. Um, it's normally $25. Um, you can go to our website. We maybe can even put a link in the chat for you um, and you can download your own copy. It's a great resource. It's got everything from studio setup, aseptic technique, uh, sterilization practices. Um, it was when I first got a hold of it, it, it really changed kind of the way that I looked at things when I first heard about the APP and I first read the procedure manual. So it's a great help of if you're looking to become a member or not. Um, now the edition is from 2013 and we're actively working on an update, but still you should download it. You should check it out if you haven't already. So We'll talk a little bit now about membership. That's why we're all here. Here, um, What does it mean to be an APP member, right? It means that you and your studio meet a specific set of health and safety standards that set forth by the organization. Um, it doesn't mean that you or your studio are certified or trained by the APP. That's not something that the APP actually does. Um, and while membership belongs to an individual, so I'm an APP member, my studio is not, um, but my studio meets membership standards, it meets criteria. There are perks to membership. So like why become a member? Well, obviously working within the membership standards, uh, we, everybody wants to be cleaner, safer, right? Offer a better service to our clients. But what do you get out of becoming a member of the APP? Um, well, first is advertisement. You know, we have a member locator on our website and a growing social media presence. Um, and so for $50 a year to renew your membership, that's really the cheapest advertisement you're going to get for your business is being featured on the, a locator like this. Um, you're also supporting an organization that works with legislators and health departments um, to make the laws that influence our industry. 
there are discounts. Everybody likes discounts. So there's discounts with our corporate sponsors that some of them offer. We also offer discounts at our conference. Uh, so there are members discounts for registering for the annual conference. There's members only classes and uh, this is a big one. People line up real early for it. You get early access to the expo floor um, at conference. In addition to the conference perks, we have a members only retreat, which is a lot smaller. It's held normally in Atlanta, Georgia. And for some people that may find uh, the conference Las Vegas experience overwhelming, um, the members retreat is kind of the opposite of that. So you're eating together in class together. Um, so there are perks to membership and these are just some of them. Um, the membership requirements, they can be found on the website, uh, safepiercing.org. Uh, the requirements are separated into two categories. We have personal criteria and we have environmental criteria. You need to meet both of those to become a member. Um, the personal criteria, as it sounds, is everything to do with the individual. So it's my CPR and first aid, it's my questionnaire, things like that. Environmental criteria, that has everything to do with the studio, uh, the studio setup. And we're going to go into each of these things as we go in this presentation here. Uh, we also have requirements and suggestions. Just like it sounds, requirements are required to achieve APP membership. While suggestions are used to help increase the health and safety awareness in the studio. So some members, they'll meet like the minimum criteria for membership, while others will go above and beyond to increase health and safety. Um, can we go to the next slide, Pablo? So the next slide is where we're gonna start talking about the walkthrough video. The walkthrough video is under that umbrella of environmental criteria. This is where we're gonna film our studio so that the committee can kind of get an idea of the layout of things. Um, so we don't want videos that are edited or have lots of cuts. We've had videos sent to us in the past that had like a lot of production and like swiping, star swipe, star swipe. Um, don't do that. <laughs> just send us, uh, and keep it simple, right? Uh, just send us the video of the studio. Don't feel like you have to edit it. Uh, the video must be shot horizontally. So there's a picture on the slide. Um, you can use a phone for this. You don't need to have a fancy camera or anything like that. Cell phones are fine. Most people's cell phones are actually like really good now. Um, just make sure you're holding the phone like this instead of like this. The problem with videos that are shot like this is you can't really get a good understanding of the surrounding area and it's kind of hard to watch. Um, so if these things like the edits or how your video is shot um, are done incorrectly, we actually will request that you reshoot the video. Now, as you move through all the rooms and areas that Sabrina and Pablo are going to talk about, uh, make sure you go slow, pan the room, show the ceiling, show the floor. Um, some videos are shot real fast and we kind of have to like stop and start to figure out what's going on and make sure we catch everything. Um, you want to show all rooms or areas in the studio, uh, open all drawers. If you have tattoo rooms, you can skip those rooms. You do not need to open all the drawers and cabinets there. Um, in fact, if you can just open the door and say, okay, this is a tattoo room, nothing piercing related happens here, and then just move on. And then don't forget the front and back of the building. So we'll move on to the next slide here where we talk about the front lobby, the counter or display area. Um, keeping in mind that everybody's studio is a little different, right? Like um, some people have really big lobbies, some people it's just a display case. Um, but go ahead and pan that area, open the drawers, open the cases. The main things that we're looking for in this area is that you have hard surface disinfectant, preferably an EPA registered hard surface disinfectant available, gloves, 
and then cups or baggies. So if case a client comes in with jewelry that they've worn and we know they never, you know, they don't always have it in a container, they're kind of reaching in their pockets or taking it out of themselves to hand it to you, uh, we need to have like cups or baggies available for that. Um, a suggestion for this area is that you have signage telling clients not to touch their piercings in the studio. But again, that's not a requirement. So we'll move to the employee hand washing area. So the employee hand washing area, this could be misleading for some people because their employee hand washing area can just be their hand washing sink in their piercing room, right? Um, but for some people it's not. And so that's why we kind of call it just the hand washing area. If your piercing room does not have a sink, that's okay. Um, you can do portable sinks if your state or city or region allows for it. Um, but if your sink is outside of the room, there are some requirements. It's got to be a reasonable distance from the piercing room. And it can't be located in any room that could be considered occupied. So like it can't be in a restroom, it can't be in a processing room. Um, and, and it can't be like off limits at any time. So in case there's an emergency, like um, an exposure incident, you need to be able to get to that sink and wash your hands. You also need to be able to not have to open like multiple doors to get to this sink. The sink that you wash your hands in for procedures, it needs to have hot and cold running water, liquid soap, and then um, they're called, we call them covered single-handed paper towel dispensers. Basically, basically, that's going to be like one of those like infrared things that spits out paper towels and you just rip it. Or it could even just be like one of those tri-fold dispensers where you fill it from the top and then you just kind of pull one out down the bottom. It just means you can't have like an open paper towel roll as your, um, your paper towels for washing your hands uh, because of contamination, right? Um, uh, infrared dispensers for soaps and, and paper towels, they're not required. Uh, it's a suggestion, right? And then the last room that I'm going to talk to you about is going to be the sterilization room. So we'll go ahead and switch the slide over to that. So again, everybody's sterilization area or room is going to look different because of their building, right? Um, if you are reprocessing tools, you're, you're, you are taking contaminated instruments, you're reprocessing them and then sterilizing them, you do have to have a completely separate room to do this. Uh, it can't happen out in the open um, or have like half walls to separate it. Um, the walls need to be a minimum of eight feet. Preferably, though, they would go from floor to ceiling to kind of contain, you know, the contamination within the room. Um, no curtains, it's got to have a door, that kind of thing. Um, no services, I mean, this seems pretty obvious, right? Like no piercing, no retail sales can happen there. And then all surfaces, like your counter, your floors, your walls, they have to be non-porous and easily disinfected um, because of the nature of what's happening there. If you have a processing room, and again, you're reprocessing tools, you do need to have an ultrasonic or an instrument washer that is meant to process contaminated items. Um, there are ultrasonics out there that are more like jewelry grade um, for like rings and necklaces and whatnot, uh, but you need a medical grade ultrasonic. Uh, if your ultrasonic doesn't have one of those like locking lids on it, um, you want to make sure that you're using a disposable shower cap to cover it when it's in use or taking like a plastic container like a Tupperware or something and flipping it over onto it when it's in use. Because ultrasonics without like a lid, locking, a locking lid can actually spread contaminants uh, within a decent range of the, of the machine. Also, you want to make sure there's a clear separation 
between what is clean and what's dirty. So when you're deciding on how to set up your processing room, you want to kind of envision, I almost envision like a flow, right? From like white to red, red being contaminated, the most contaminated and white being uh, clean or even sterile. Um, and then pink would be kind of something that's not quite uh, as contaminated as the red stuff, but it isn't quite as clean or sterile as the stuff here. And so see how you can separate those things where you have your clean areas, your autoclave, your anodizer, what have you. And then you have areas that are for tools to dry and then tools that are going in the ultrasonic and in the sink to be scrubbed. You don't kind of want to put like your autoclave right in the middle of contaminated areas. If space is an issue, um, using things like a plexiglass divider or even a metal divider is real helpful for um, providing that separation, right? So separation doesn't have to be with a lot of space. It could be with physical barriers. Um, Pablo, if you can move to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. Um, so this is where we're talking about, you know, barriers and stuff like that, making sure that um, that our ultrasonic and our sink for processing tools is as far from our autoclave as possible. Um, so the best place to start when you're setting up your room is go, where is the plumbing? Okay, this is where the sink needs to be okay, well, if the sink is here, then my ultrasonic needs to go here. And then where is opposite of that? That's where my autoclave needs to go. Um, hand washing should never take place in the sink that's in this room. And you should have a sign above that says so. Um, if you're processing tools, that is not the appropriate place to wash your hands. And then the front door of this room um, should be marked as employees only. So if we move to the next slide, um, these are suggestions. Again, everything I've talked about for the processing room, those are required. Um, now these are some suggestions for increased health and safety in the studio. Um, so having a separate ultrasonic or a jewelry steamer for use on clean, unworn jewelry only. So when you have a piece of jewelry that you receive from a manufacturer that's never been worn, never been contaminated, you would uh, use like a jewelry steamer or a clean jewelry ultrasonic to process it before sterilizing it or anodizing the jewelry. Um, a HEPA filter or an air purifier. So having these in the sterilization room is also a great idea due to the nature of the contamination that's within that room. Um, so, and, and we don't have a preferred brand of HEPA filter. Uh, you just wanna make sure that it's rated for what you're using it for and the space that you're using it in. And then for your autoclave, there's lots of different autoclaves out there. Again, there's not one brand of autoclave that you have to have to be an APP member. You don't have to have a statum, right? Like sometimes it seems that way because a lot of us have them and it's because they're great machines and they work well. But I've also worked with lots of other autoclaves and those you can be a member with those. You just can't have like a, like a pressure cooker or a top loading autoclave. Um, so, our recommendation for your autoclave besides those other requirements is that you have something with a closed door dry cycle. Uh, these types of autoclaves, they're intended to sterilize lumens. Lumens are hollow items. So piercing needles, um, receiving tubes, um, those are important. We use those every day in body piercing. Um, and so having an autoclave that's meant to sterilize those things is important. Now, uh, disposable. What if, what if you're a single use studio or you run a disposable setup? So single use or disposable for those that don't know, it means that, okay, I have um, a receiving tube or a hemostat or a clamp and it's never been used on anybody before. I sterilize it, I use it on my client, and then it goes into the trash or into the sharps container, uh, whatever's the proper receptacle, and it doesn't get, doesn't get reprocessed, doesn't get used again. If you operate like that, 
you do not need to have a sterilization room. You do have to have an autoclave, of course, but you don't need to have like reprocessing taking place. Um, there are other things that we'll look for if you are operating disposably. Um, so that is going to be it uh, for me talking. I, I talk a lot. Thanks for listening to it. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sabrina um, so that they can talk more about the piercing room. Awesome. All right. Let me test if I have control of this slide. <laughs> See? Yep. Woot woot. Awesome. All right. So now we're going to talk about um, piercing room requirements in the video. Um, pretty much, uh, you're going to want to show every corner of this room. You're going to want to show in every drawer, every cabinet, um, all the surfaces. Um, make sure to do this slowly. Um, a big mistake, a pretty common issue we have is when people go really quick. We have to pause the video and put on our good glasses and try to see all the things that we need. And sometimes that can delay your application because we have to reach out to you. Um, so take your time with showing all of these things. Um, a handy trick that we usually suggest is open all the drawers and cabinets ahead of time before you film. So then as you show all of them, you can close them um, just to be sure that you showed all of those areas. Um, the piercing room itself does have to be its own separate room. Um, it has to have walls, it has to have the ceiling, and it does have to have a door. Um, the walls don't have to meet the ceiling, but they do have to be um, a minimum of eight feet. Um, and make sure you reference any local ordinances about that as well. Um, an alternative, um, sometimes we have people that have windows and they have curtains up to offer privacy. Um, you want to make sure that any curtains you have are non-porous um, or a really good alternative to curtains um, is you can actually put up vinyl cling. It's pretty easily accessible um, online or in most uh, um, stores. Um, it can be disinfected and wiped down because it's non-porous. It lets the light in and it does offer privacy as well. Um, all right. You can go to the next slide. All right. Um, another thing to note about the piercing room is all the flooring and the surfaces, uh, they must be sealed and non-porous. Uh, just to make sure that they can be wiped down regularly and disinfected. Um, examples of surfaces that would need to be uh, non-porous uh, would be like the piercing table, your counters, um, window coverings, cabinets, um, pretty much anything that could get contaminated agents on it. You want to make sure that you can safely wipe that down um, with a medical grade disinfectant. Um, Make sure you're storing all of your uh, sterilized or clean implements as well um, in containers within drawers or cabinets to make sure they don't get uh, contaminated and they're sealed away from dust and stuff like that. And make sure to show in all these cabinets. And if you're disposable, make sure you have the tools to show that you are. <laughs> right. And then, continuing on, um, wall mounting sharp spins. Uh, you want to make sure that that sharps container uh, is a secure to the wall, and B, it is a reasonable height so that your shortest employee can safely look into uh, that sharps container and make sure that any sharps have been safely disposed into the bottom of it. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a uh, non-porous tray or container that is marked biohazardous if you are a tool user um, and you do reprocess. Um, you want to make sure that it is lidded, non-porous, um, and it is marked accordingly so you don't have any uh, issues with somebody touching it. 
Um, we recommend usually storing this tray um, in a secure way to avoid cross-contamination or potential for spillage. Um, a really handy thing is to have um, a corner of your piercing room dedicated to everything that could be considered dirty or contaminated. Um, so you would have your sharps bin, you would have your tool tray, and you would have your trash can there. Um, if you are disposable, uh, which means you do not reprocess or reuse tools, you use them one time and you throw them away, uh, you are not required to have a disposable, or uh, to have a tool tray. Right, and we will go to the next slide. Awesome. All right. Um, in the piercing room, you want to make sure that there is a clear difference between your clean areas and your dirty areas. Um, like I just spoke about, about having that designated dirty area, um, that is a super good way to do that. Although that's not required, uh, it's not required to have all of them in one area, it's just a handy way to kind of make sure clients don't get into contact with it and you don't accidentally touch it with anything clean. Um, all trash cans that are kept in the piercing room specifically, um, they should be lidded and be foot operated or motion activated, um, just to make sure there's no uh, cross contamination um, or biohazardous materials getting on um, that outside area by being touched. So you do wanna make sure that you can safely dispose of all of your implements that are not sharp in there. Um, another really good suggestion, again, not a requirement, is having a HEPA air filter um, or any other air purification system on your studio um, in the piercing room. And as many products as you are using for a piercing or setting up or marking um, should be sterile or single use. Um, that is a really good habit to get into. All right. So that was about it for piercing room. Um, we do have some other requirements in the video um, for the employee lounge area or restrooms. Um, it is to be noted that it is not a requirement to have either of these spaces. Just if you do have them, this is kind of like what we're looking for with those areas. Um, these areas or rooms should not house any ultrasonics or autoclaves or anything um, that would be used for processing. Um, and you don't want any services going on in this room that are related to piercing, tattooing, or retail sales. So these would be completely separate areas. Um, one thing to note is you can store any piercing related items in your uh, employee lounge area but do not store them in the bathroom. Um, and you do, when you're showing these areas, uh, want to show, again, just kind of like the piercing room, you wanna show all the cabinets and drawers, um, just so we can make sure that those storage areas are being used correctly. Um, and you do want to maintain a level of cleanliness wherever you are storing your extra supplies. So if you are storing your supplies in an employee lounge area, it's not required to keep them in a cabinet, but stuff like gauze, don't have open gauze on top of the microwave or vice versa. You don't want any um, things putting that contamination on there. Um, we also suggest putting uh, signage in the restroom letting clients know not to change their own jewelry in there. Um, specifically, we don't have a mirror in our studio just because we had a lot of clients trying to change stuff in the mirror. Um, so it's not a requirement obviously to have that signage or to not have a mirror, but sometimes that stuff does happen. So just putting a sign right in front of people's faces, telling them not to do that and to leave it to you is a good way to make sure that Obviously, you're wiping down all these areas pretty often anyway, but you're not having to do that every time someone goes in the restroom. Awesome. So our next tab is going to be a question slide. Ha, ha, ha. Perfect. And I will hand it over to Pablo. Sweet. Seems, seems like everybody is doing great with the 
with the Q&A in our comedy so they're answering <laughs> most of your questions. Yeah, uh, so we had about 15 or so questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Becky can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that people can see the Q&A and what's been answered there. So we'll just gonna, we're just gonna review some of the Q&A stuff before we move on what's been asked so far in case it helps you um, or helps clarify something you were wondering about. Um, so does the APP require a separate organization for countries that has no existing APP members? So no, uh, we don't require a separate organization for countries um, if it, in order for you to become an APP member. Uh, while some countries do have that, and that's wonderful to have that resource, it's not required. Um, let me go ahead. So what if your area, your country has no health and safety laws pertaining to the industry and no licensing gets issued? Um, there's a lot of times where like local law isn't as strict as APP membership requirements, right? And so that's okay. If you meet the laws there, then you meet the laws there. But if you don't meet the APP requirements, then you don't meet the APP requirements, right? So you can go above and beyond what's required in your city, uh, in your state, in your country. Um, can I mail my video? Please don't. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, we talked about portable sinks. Those are okay as long as it's allowed. Um, it's got to have hot and cold running water. Um, and as long as your local health um, officials allow it. Uh, what if processing room has two separate sides, like a dirty side and the sink and and the sink is on the clean side. Um, I think it's all about how it's separated, right? Um, if you're putting up barriers and things are labeled, um, that could totally work, but I think it's up to the individual setup. We might need to look at a photo. So you could always shoot us an email. We also have, and somebody can put a link in the chat, maybe one of the committee members. We have a Facebook forum called the APP non-member forum. Uh, it's a great place to like post pictures, ask questions, that kind of thing, but also to read through questions that have been asked before. Um, if your room has a door, can the sink be in the hallway area? Yes, as long as it's a reasonable distance from the piercing room. Um, maybe look into getting a door that can be opened without your hand, like a push door, like a swinging door or something that allows you to open with your foot. Um, so just so you don't have to touch it to get back in. Can I have an instrument washer in my piercing room? Instrument washers are completely um, enclosed. So they're not like an ultrasonic and that could be in the piercing room, but it's all dependent on your individual setup. You don't want to be like drying tools uh, on a counter there or anything like that. Um, a sliding barn door would work, right? You can use like your foot to open it. Sorry, I just saw that in the chat. Uh, let's see some other questions. HEPA filters are mandatory? No, they're just a suggestion. They're highly suggested, uh, but not required for membership. Uh, if I'm 100% disposable, do I need a dirty sink? Absolutely not. You do not need a dirty sink. You do need an autoclave, but you don't need a dirty ultrasonic and you don't need a dirty sink. Uh, we do have a few questions in the new... Uh in the open Q&A. Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and leave those. Uh, so you can be a member while your shop is not, no. So it, your shop needs to meet the standards. In order for a person to be a member, in order for like me to be a member, the studio that I work at needs to meet those standards. We don't actually offer membership to studios. It's like a technical thing so it belongs to the person but the studio does need to meet those standards no one else in your studio needs to be a member for you to be a member as long as you are a piercer and meet the criteria for business members 
how do you become a member if you are a traveling piercer? So um, we don't offer memberships for traveling piercers unless they're an existing APP member already. Um, if you become an APP member at a studio, that's your primary studio, and then you leave that studio and you start traveling, we do have a business member at large category, but only existing members are um, able to take advantage of that. If you are disposable, can you have the autoclave and ultrasonic on the clean side of your piercing room if the room is big enough? So if you're disposable, I'm going to assume that that ultrasonic is the clean ultrasonic, then yes, right? If it's a dirty ultrasonic, um, then I would say you're not disposable because you're using a, an ultrasonic to reprocess. Um, if it was, if you weren't disposable and you had a dirty ultrasonic and then an autoclave, you would have to put up some kind of physical barrier between the two. So we'll go ahead and um, I think we'll talk more about, we'll address some questions. Let's get more through um, the presentation and then we'll come back to the Q&A. Uh, don't worry, we will answer your questions. All right, I'm gonna take over now. Uh, as you notice, I have an accent, so I'm gonna try to speak as slow as I can, okay? Uh, our first slide, we're gonna talk about uh, environmental criteria. The environmental criteria, it will start with your payment, right? You will have a $50 fee registration and that's gonna be charged uh, when you finish the application. And um, when you are preparing your, your application, it's really, really important for you to be organized, right? To make sure that you have the photos that are required for uh, the application to go on. When you are taking photos of things like autoclaves, there's a few different things that we wanna see. First, we wanna see a front, front face of where the autoclave is. And second, what we wanna see is, I don't know if you can see my, yeah. We wanna see the backlog. The backlog have the serial number and have some information that show us that that autoclave is yours. It's not that we don't believe in you, we just wanna make sure the process is clear. Um, other of the things that we are interested in is your most recent biological sport test. Um, sport test is different everywhere. Here in the US, we have a really simple system where we do our sport tests, we send it by mail, and we get the results. That's not the case in other countries, correct? So if your country doesn't allow uh, biological sport tests, uh, we can accept a helix test that can be done by yourself. What we are gonna ask you is to have a photo of your helix log. Uh, you can find a copy of the log in the manual of procedures that's for free on, on our website. Um, if you keep up with the helix log, and you send us updates all the time, we are okay uh, accepting that as an alternative. Now, if you live in the US, we are gonna require uh, sport testing. It, if you live in a country that has sport testing, that's uh, what we recommend as best practice. Um, I'm going to pass, I'm going fine. Cool. <laughs> uh, other things that you're gonna need is copies of all your release forms. Um, release forms are really important for us. We wanna make sure that we can help you with suggestions in how to improve the release form. Um, we wanna see uh, during insertion release form. We wanna see um, it, it anchor release forms. We want to try to see as many diverse sections in your release to make sure that you're protected when you're doing a piercing, right? We want to make sure that your minor release form is uh, a, a legal document that will protect you from uh, a minor fake in an ID or something similar. Um, make sure you send us a copy of everything. If you have a digital uh, release form, you can totally take a screenshot of the release form and just send that to us. Make sure you have the whole entire form for us. 
And other thing that you're gonna need is a copy of all the aftercare uh, information that you give in the studio. If you have separate aftercares for different piercings, we want to see them all. Um, current uh, studio business or establishment uh, license, we want to see a license to make sure your business is a legal business, that you're operating uh, following your local uh, regulations. Uh, if your studio doesn't have a license for body piercing in specific, please contact us. We are going to try to work with you, make sure that uh, the licensing that you have will affect the, the membership correctly. Um, we want to see some business cards can be current, can be past business cards. We just want to make sure those business cards reflect that you're working in the business that you're trying to apply to. Uh, we want to see one or more recent samples of uh, advertising. This is a tricky one. This is the one that we get more emails from. <laughs> uh, if you take a, a simple snapshot of your Instagram, where you have a photo that, of a person that you did that's dated, we are okay with that. If you have something better, awesome. If you have a magazine where you appear in one or two years ago, if you have uh, any kind of uh, advertising that show us that you have been in business for longer than a year, that's what we wanna see. Uh, don't feel like you don't have uh, enough to show us. There's always uh, a way to find it, right? Uh, if you have questions regarding that, please contact us. We totally want to help you to find the way to uh, verify for uh, how long you have been piercing and all that. Um, I'm missing anything? No. So liability insurance. Uh, the copy of certificate of liability insurance is uh, more for U.S. shops. Uh, if you are outside of the U.S. and you don't have uh, if it's not available to you, uh, that doesn't keep you away to become a, a body piercer. If you are in the U.S., we would really like to have a copy of it uh, to maybe give you some suggestions in how to improve it. Uh, jury orders. This is, uh, this is the real deal. This is <laughs> where we all uh, struggle, myself included, uh, when we are applying. What we need from you for the jury orders is at least 90 days uh, of invoices that show that you have enough styles, quantities, and that the jury that you're using is into our standards. So what, what I'm talking about styles, we love to see all your fancy tops. Gold tops are awesome. We all like them. We all like to sell them. But it's really important for us to be able to prove that you have enough uh, of different styles to perform all the piercings with the jewelry that you're showing us. So we want to see barbels, we want to see captive earrings, we want to see labrets, we want to see uh, circular barbels, we want to see different kind of rings. We want to try to see as many styles as you have. If your shop doesn't do enough uh, orders in those 90 days for you to prove that, it's okay if you send us other uh, invoices that have enough quantity for us to verify that the jewelry that you're using is uh, up to the standard. Um, now, then we are gonna get into quantities, right? Let's say you're a small shop that doesn't do uh, a lot of certain piercings. Anyways, we wanna make sure you can operate every day with the jewelry that you're proving that you're operating. So if we are using the breads and let's say your studio make five piercings a day, correct? That means that we need at least 20 to 40 uh, units of each uh, style that you're using to make for us to ensure that the quality, with the quantities of the jewelry that you're showing is uh, what you can actually use, right? Um, so we want to see the styles of the jewelry, make sure you have all the different uh, styles of shafts, uh, we want to see that you have enough jewelry to work with. And here's the last one. <laughs> we want to make sure that your jewelry follow the acceptable standards, right? The APP has uh, a minimum standard for jewelry, uh, and those standards follow a few different rules. The, one of the main rules is the DOFARS. The DOFARS is an agreement between countries 
that allow countries to sell uh, jewelry that's uh, standardized by different companies. One of those companies is ISO, other of those companies is ASDM. So there's many countries that form part of this uh, agreement. We have a list of companies that we was able to verify, but at the same time, we also have a list of companies that we wasn't able to verify. I know this is tricky and read meal certificates is really difficult. I live for it. Uh, it's something I love to do and I do all the time, but it, it is difficult. We are more than happy. We are 100% available for you to help you find the, if the jewelry that you're trying to uh, buy is up to those standards. And when you buy jewelry, for you to have an idea, all jewelry is made of certain components, right? We can say that Monica and I, we wanna make a cake, right? <laughs> and we both have the same ingredients. In order for us to test that those ingredients was combined correctly, those ingredients have to follow a recipe. And that recipe is gonna be our standards. Uh, still, when we both have the same ingredients, that also means that the final end of the material is gonna be the same if we mix it in different ways. So for us to be able to coordinate uh, testing for all those steps on the recipe, we wanna follow different uh, standardizations. We like to use the ASTM, that's uh, F136, F138, and those are for uh, steel and titanium. We also have F1295, uh, but there's materials that come up all the time, and our company is always trying to stay up to those standards. So what I was saying is, let's uh, use this, uh, those cakes as a sample, right? Cake one, have the same ingredients that cake two. It has a similar recipe, but those recipes have been followed and tracked in different ways. So the end result, in both you have cakes, no both of the cakes are the same cake, right? So we wanna guarantee consistency. And that's why it's important for us to follow those uh, standardizations, right? Uh, I'm going too fast. I'm speaking too fast. Cool. Uh, so I, I know it's tricky, but for you to have an idea, when a company manufacture metal, they give us a meal certificate. They give the company that buy the metal a meal certificate. That meal certificate represents one material, uh, one, one uh, ton of that material. If we think about it, let's say a jewelry company have 50 styles, 20, 50 styles. Uh, it's really hard to believe that all the styles come from the same size of bar. So that same company for different styles is gonna to have to use different sizes of bar. And that means that there's different meal certificates that go with that. Uh, when a company provides us only one certificate, it's always uh, hard to believe, right? We wanna make sure that the whole entire line that they are, uh, that they are manufacturing is made out of that uh, standard size uh, metal. So what we're gonna do uh, us as a membership company when we receive the meal certificates is verify that all the, all the jewelry that they are manufacturing follow those standards and that we have enough meal certificates to verify that the jury is going up to those uh, standardizations. I know it's difficult and it's a little bit tricky, but I will answer all the questions in there, I promise. So to add on yeah. to that, um, what happens a lot that we see regarding this specific issue is that um, there are jewelry companies that will advertise that their jewelry meets a certain yep. ASTM criteria. Um, and so I've, we've gotten asked, well, how can they claim that if it's not true? There's nobody stopping them from making that no. ASTM claim. They can do it. 
what we need to do as consumers of these goods and as people who sell these things to our clients is we need to ask those questions and look for those documents to support the claims. So you will see people say that the jewelry they're selling or making or distributing is ASTM F136 implant grade titanium. And you're like, cool, I got everything I need. Um, if you're unsure about a company and if their jewelry meets standards, ask for mill certificates. Um, if you don't know how to review a mill certificate, send it to members at safepiercing.org. We're more than happy to help you uh, figuring out brands that do or do not meet standards. The ASDM really don't pursue uh, falsification of those materials. Uh, it's not something that they do. Uh, so yeah. it, it is really up to us to make sure that we are buying what we are buying and that the person that's selling us the material have all the label right of how the material was known what materials are inside of that and that everything is done correctly um, okay so we need to complete uh, complete a small questionnaire i got an emphasis in in this is no group questionnaires. You cannot copy paste your friend. We can see it. <laughs> we know when we have group questionnaires. So make sure you complete it with your own words. Uh, make sure your answers are as clear as possible. You don't really need to answer 5,000 pages for each question. Just we want to make sure that you know what we're asking you for. Um, the next that we are going to need is a current CPR. Uh, and first aid that is up to date first. Uh, second, it can be from any country. We don't require a US uh, CPR or first aid. We can uh, absolutely do an online training. The APP have no issue with that. And please make sure that the expiration date is going to give us enough time for us to review your application and the certificate that you have still be current. If not, we will call you and ask you for a current one. Uh, separate courses are fine. Combined courses are fine. Either way you can get it, we are okay with that. Just make sure you have it and make sure you have both, uh, both ones. When you take CPR courses, not always those courses have the first aid, so triple check it just in case. And other of the personal criteria that you're gonna need is your current BBP, uh, is your bloodborne pathogen training. Uh, the APP provide one online. Uh, you can take one that's not from the APP. If you take a uh, um, BBP that's uh, from outside of our organization, we will take it e either way. The cool part of the APP bloodborne pathogens is that it's built specifically for our industry. So you're going to get a more current information in what's relevant to that course. Course uh, BVPs that are outside of our organization will give you some uh, extra information that's not going to be as useful for you than uh, ours. Um, yeah, and make sure that if you do uh, BVP certification outside of the APP that that follow your local and federal federal regulations, please. Uh, probably is OSHA if you're in the US. Um, here's what we was talking uh, early about. What's a good proof of how long I've been piercing, right? This is a screenshot of my Facebook. So what I did is I take the photo and you can see that the shop where I apply is there and the date that uh, I post that photo is at least a year older than my, my current application. I can, you can also send us a notarized statement. Uh, that should come from a party older than the applicant. You cannot make a notarized statement for yourself. Please don't do that. Um, a dated business document is fine. A dated ad, uh, advertising or social media post, as you can see in the screen. Or if you have any kind of a newspaper article, you can absolutely uh, take a photo of that and send us a proof of uh, how long you have been piercing. Um, 
you're going to have to acknowledge uh, the current APP code of conduct and the law agreement. Uh, that's non-negotiable. Uh, we highly suggest for you to read it. So once you become a member, you can have the rules, uh, terms, and, uh, terms and rules of how our organization works and what can jeopardize your, uh, your membership, correct? Uh, I highly, highly recommend to read it. Once you re renew your uh, membership, the code of conduct sometimes update. I'm correct, Monica, in that? What was that? That sometimes when we renew uh, our applications, uh, we renew the code of conduct. Yes, so um, our code of conduct is a mix between like the logo agreement and, and the membership criteria because you're signing and saying that I will adhere to these criteria as a member. And so if things change, we update and review that code of conduct. So every year when you sign it, I mean, with anything, um, I think the general advice is to read anything that you sign. But if you want to stay up to date on what you are required to do in order to maintain your membership, um, that is a, is a great document to review. Yeah, I highly recommend to read it every time you sign it. Uh, there's different small things that change all the time, and we want to make sure you're aware of those changes happening. Uh, cool. Anyone have any questions? I see that you all have been answering questions like crazy there, like Ninja. That's pretty good. <laughs> There's a lot in the Q&A we can probably go over um, for everybody as well, just in case any of those situations. Uh, multiple people. Let's see. Our Drury standard release, Drury insert release form mandatory. No, they're not. Uh, we recommend for you to have a release form for body piercing. Uh, and we will give you a really hard suggestion in having one, just so you can keep track of who's coming to your shop, what service you're doing. Uh, but the insertion is no actual requirement, it's a suggestion. But the body piercing release form is uh, required, 100%. Uh, can the aftercare be digital? If your local government allow you, yes. Uh, I will double check with your health department. Uh, but if they allow you to do that, that's fine. Just send us a screenshot of the uh, aftercare and we will be happy to review it. So we have uh, a new question. Can a current APP member provide a notarized statement to verify the length I have been piercing? So anybody that could verify that information can provide that notarized statement. So if they, if you know, if that's somebody you've worked with, or a colleague, as long as they, they can speak to that and are willing to do so in a notarized statement, that's just fine. Um, so another thing that I thought of while, um, you know, that I didn't cover earlier, but I thought it's a good tip. When you're shooting your video, you don't need to have a second person, like someone filming you while you walk through the studio, but it is wildly helpful. So when you're trying to shoot your video and you have to do like a glove change or something like that, it gets really hard and awkward. Or if you're trying to show things um, and open drawers at the same time while you're holding the, the phone or the camera. So my suggestion is to find anybody that's willing to, um, to, uh, shoot the video for you, right? So they'll hold the camera while you walk through the studio. So there's, can you please comment more on the self-taught topic? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Is there anything, if you wanna ask a question that's more specific, um, I, every piercer goes through different types of training and stuff like that. Um, so we all have different backgrounds, I'm sure. Um, there are minimum amount of times that somebody needs to be piercing professionally to become a business member of the APP, and they must be able to pass our health and safety questionnaire um, and then provide everything, obviously everything else that's been there. 
Um, the APP also has a apprenticeship guideline uh, that suggested. I will highly recommend you to read it. Uh, that's a good document. Okay. Is there any list with all the suppliers who supply jewelry that's APP compliant? I know the big brands like IS and Nada Metal, Nia Metal, but are there smaller companies as well or that aren't located in the US and shipping and taxes can put prices so high, our clients mostly pass on them. So we don't have an official list that's like on the website, um, mostly because we're trying to work on a project where we verify mill certificates regularly from companies. So like, let's say uh, company X, right? Just, I'm just gonna say that for the sake of conversation, meets our standards today and, and they've provided mill certificates. We wanna ensure that they're regularly purchasing new materials that meet those standards. Um, so we don't have a list because it's something that fluctuates and changes over time. If you are in a certain area and you need resources, please utilize email. It's the best way for us to help you with your specific stuff because um, there are other companies in other areas we don't endorse certain companies we have sponsors of course um, but you don't have to be a sponsor for uh, for your jewelry to meet our standards or anything like that Um, one other thing, uh, when we were talking about like filming the walkthrough and having someone to help you is really good. Um, if you are lucky enough to have somebody to help you, there's actually a really good, um, like a checklist online that we added that has all of the things that we kind of talked about through the slideshow of things that we're looking for in each room. Um, so you can actually print that out yourself and you can put it on a little board and check through to make sure you are hitting all the things that we're looking for. Um, when I filmed one, uh, it was very helpful, even though I do this. <laughs> So um, we don't have any other new questions uh, that are in here right now, um, but I can look through some of the questions here. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to bring up? Um, So the jewelry standard, it is for initial piercing jewelry. Um, that's for the jewelry that's used for initial piercings. Of course, studios can carry wood plugs or brass hanging items, gold plated hanging items, right? Um, as long as they're not piercing with those things uh, because they would be inappropriate to do so. So we don't have any other questions. So for right now, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna bring this to a close today. Um, I think it was really good. We got a lot of really great questions, some questions that we've gotten before, some that we haven't. Um, on the slide right here, you have the members at safepiercing.org email. Um, so you know, feel free to email us. Also, um, a lot of these questions have been answered before. Um, in our forum. So if you go to the APP non-member forum, um, that is where you can kind of like, it's on Facebook if you're on there, that you can read through people's questions they've asked before. I have one more question that just came through. The benefits apply for patrons as well. Patron members don't get the same kind of, uh, um, well, they're not even members, they're patrons, right? It's not, they're not a member they're a patron of the APP. That just means you support us. Um, you can't use the logo. You can't, uh, you don't get discounts with jewelry companies. Um, none of that stuff. It's just kind of saying like, hey, I support you. I'm gonna provide a contribution, a financial contribution and, and um, pass on the word of safe piercing. Um, you can find more information like that on our website as well. So uh, thank you everybody for being here uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Stay thank you. healthy, stay happy, stay compassionate, please. Yes. Bye.